in the event of a government shutdown, hundreds of thousands of these dedicated public servants who stay on the job will do so without pay. And several hundred thousand more will be immediately and indefinitely furloughed without pay. Uh, what, of course, will not be furloughed are the bills that they have to pay, their mortgages, their tuition payments, their car notes. These Americans are our neighbors. Their kids go to our schools. They worship where we do. They serve their country with pride. They are the customers of every business in this country. And they would be hurt greatly. And as a consequence, all of us will be hurt greatly should Congress choose to shut the people's government down. Professor Peter Matthews back on the program with us. Thank you, Professor, on this day when we're watching, looking east and wondering how is this going to affect us. And then we've got county workers by the tens of thousands who will be walking off their jobs. It's being predicted tomorrow. What uh, what history we are witnessing truly, what does this say? I guess when it rains, it pours, Dave. That's what's going on right now. <laughs> I was and, expecting uh, something <laughs> deeper, but what is it? Yeah, I mean, are workers at the are workers at the breaking point where they're saying, "I've had it. I'm not going to do it anymore." Well, a lot of them are. But what's really causing this is, you know, the government, the Congress, cannot agree between the right wing Tea Party Republicans and the moderate Democrats as to whether or not to continue funding the government, like they're supposed to by midnight tonight. They want to, the right wing wants to cut off the Obamacare funding. That's the real problem here. And they're saying, okay, now we won't ask for a cutoff of Obamacare right now. We'll ask for a delay of one year. And that's not going to fly either. That's what the House just asked for, and the Senate turned them down. All right. We have, had, we have had 17, 17 government shutdowns since 1976, but never on the scale of what we're seeing this time. In 1995, we had something comparable between President, then President Clinton and the Congress, but nothing on the scale of what we're seeing today. And yet, I'm not sure that people really connect with the idea of a government shutdown. When does it start to really hit home? Well, it starts a step at a time. I mean, uh, in 1995 and 96, it was a six-day shutdown in 95 and 21-day shutdown in 96. And the key issue at stake in Congress was Medicare cuts aid for the poor, and budget deficits. Today, it's not those kinds of issues. It's other issues like this Obamacare. So it won't hit right away, David. It'll be step by step. But let me give you some examples. Right now, once this thing starts being implemented on Tuesday, there'll be cutoffs in the Center for Disease Control. They'll stop monitoring diseases in the National Institute of Health. Research will be cut back. Law enforcement will be cut back in the Bureau of Alcohol and Tobacco and Firearms. They won't be processing applications for firearms anymore. They'll stop work on... 3,500 bankruptcy cases and child support cases. But for most people, parks and museums, that's not it. Parks and museums will be shut down right away. 368 parks and museums, so tourists will be hit. Seven million tourists will go to those parks and museums. They'll start uh, feeling it right away. And visas and passports, that'll be cut back in terms of issuing them. Veteran services ranging from health and welfare to finance and travel will be curtailed. And 1.2 million federal workers will be out of work or laid off at least for now. Not laid off, but, you know, what's called furloughed out of 2 million workers. So other than that, I mean, the other 300 million Americans are going to go along unless they have specialized things. They want to go on vacation. You know, they want to go to parks and enjoy themselves camping out. That's where they're going to start feeling it. So it'll, it'll start gradually. But here's the thing, psychological problem, and that's a psychoeconomic problem because yes. now you're talking about the biggest government in the world, with the, big, the biggest uh, economy in the world. It's government not being able to perform basic services. That just is a psychological hit. That's going to cause havoc on Wall Street and financial markets pretty soon. Now, you know, you and I have talked often, and on this day it's very appropriate to, to look at this. I was looking at the numbers on, the, on the, the cost to the individual under the Affordable Care Act, and I gave the example of a 27-year-old single person who makes 25000 a year. Mm-hmm. He or she will pay $218 a month for the middle-of-the-road plan. Some people believe that that is too big of a burden. Uh, How do you balance the need for everyone to have health care with the need for us to be realistic in in the face of what is still a challenging economy for small businesses? I think uh, it's it's true that two hundred and whatever two hundred eighteen dollars two eighteen two eighteen is a lot of money for someone making only twenty five thousand a year. That's two thousand a month. That's ten over ten percent goes into the health care for him or her. 
and they haven't been paying it so far, most of them. Right. But the government will subsidize some of the more moderate income people. But you're saying they still have to pay $218. That's still a lot of money. Well, I'm not, so I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not sure uh, uh, Professor, that that would not uh, be before the subsidy. So let me just say that out of pocket, it's 218 Whether there is a subsidy beyond that, I cannot tell you because I don't have the charts in front of me. Right. There are some subsidies that will help with that, but still, you see, President Obama, when he was a candidate, was against the individual mandate. Hillary Clinton advocated it. He said, no, there's going to be a burden on individuals. Then it came down to reality time, in his view, and he said, I've got to deal with these insurance companies, I've got to deal with all the HMOs, and I've got to give them something, and I've got to get people to pay, even out of their own pocket. And he switched his position. So I've always said the best health care system would be a single-payer Medicare for all that would be very efficient, Dave. It's only 3% overhead cost for our Medicare system, which works very well for the elderly. It's 22% overhead cost for all these private companies that are really using up our health care dollar. Only it's 22 cents out of the dollars that goes for that. One more thing. You know, if health coverage in Canada is paid for by the, at least a major part of the, what's going on there, Medicare for all, it's paid for by the government. It's a nonprofit insurance company. And therefore, it costs nothing for the employer. He doesn't have to pay for the health Yeah, but you know what? No, but let me tell you something. I've heard those arguments before, but I can also tell you that I've heard the horror stories. When I needed to go through my procedure, I was in there in a relatively short period of time, maybe a couple of weeks. Uh, Had I been in Canada, my brother, that would have been a couple of months. Well, it depends. On the procedure, it depends where you're located. Plus, the Canadian government, since you heard the horror stories, has changed their policy. They put more money in the system. And I'm not saying we could go that immediately. It's a very tough system to go to because it would be cutting out a lot of the private insurance companies right now. Absolutely. But I'm just saying, Detroit, an automaker in Detroit, if he's there anymore, there are some factories there, I believe. The car makers in Detroit, it costs them $1,000 more per car because of health care costs because they're covering their employees. In Canada, it's $1,000 less to make that car and sell it. So I think it would take, it would relieve the businesses of this burden if we could do it in an efficient way, get the health care dollars straight to the uh, doctor and the patient directly on the nurses, as opposed to a lot of that stuff. So, I mean, that's, that's a very... I would, All I right, so right now, question. right now it's 742 in Washington, D.C. Any, if you're a gambling man, I know you're not, you've got a beautiful family, they don't let you in Vegas, but if you were to roll the dice the next four hours and 45 minutes, you see anything changing? No, no chance. We're going to go into a shutdown starting 12.01 a.m. midnight tonight, right after midnight. Uh, that, that's, that's my prediction. I'm sure that's what's going to happen. And then they'll try to work out compromises as we go along. Now, if they take too long to do that, if they take several weeks, that can cause some serious damage to the financial markets in this country. If they do it within three days or so, not so much of a problem, even though it'll still cost them the millions to put us back on track again. I'll tell you what, Peter, keep, uh, keep an eye on it, Professor. We will bring you back probably tomorrow as we go into day one of what is probably going to be the first uh, this kind of a scaled uh, shutdown since ninety five, ninety six, and uh, we'll talk then. We sure will. Okay. Professor Peter Matthews from uh, Cypress College, our political analyst, giving us his take on it.